Thanks everyone for being here so late. Um, this is sort of a big topic to go over in 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to breeze through quickly and um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end if, if people have questions. Sorry. And I have no disclosures. So there are a variety of studies that are used um, commonly to work up patients with reflux. I think these four studies are the four most commonly used studies. Obviously, in an ideal world, potentially every patient would undergo an, an EGD, a manometry, a pH study, and a bearing swallow, but that's not really practical in this day and age, so I would say most, uh, most people who uh, are taking care of patients with reflux will selectively use some of these studies. We, we have a protocol at uh, University of Wisconsin where we start out by screening everyone, starting out with an EGD and a, a barium swallow and sort of go from there, but you know, I think whatever works for you uh, is okay, and I'm just gonna briefly go through some of these studies and, and let you know how we use them um, in our practice and, and maybe give you some tips for what you might be able to do as well. So obviously an EGD, it's the most basic study. It, it can give you a lot of information in the topic of uh, reflux. We look for primarily evidence of pathologic reflux disease. That mostly ends up being esophagitis, although obviously patients can present with peptic strictures or ulcers. I would say the evidence is pretty clear that if you have LA grade C or D esophagitis, it's pretty obvious that your patient has an abnormal amount of reflux and you probably don't need to get a pH study to prove that. Um, LA grade A, you know, I would say plus or minus, and I think in our practice, I'm still, I'm still uh, okay with not getting a pH study with someone who has LA grade B esophagitis, but I think that sort of depends on, on, the, on the practice and also uh, patient's uh, symptoms. Uh, obviously, if the patient has Barrett's esophagus, again, that is pretty, pretty conclusive evidence that your patient has pathologic uh, acid reflux. Whether or not you want to um, uh, offer patient therapy for their Barrett's esophagus, particularly if they have dysplasia or uh, long segment Barrett's esophagus, that's um, whether or not you want to do that pre-surgery or post-surgery, uh, there's not any great evidence to, to, to say one way or the other, uh, but although it's really important to note that you really must uh, counsel your patient that just doing an anti-reflux operation on someone with Barrett's does not decrease their risk for progression to adenocarcinoma. There's no level one evidence to show that. And so even after surgery, patients will need to continue to go routine um, uh, monitoring for their Barrett's esophagus. So really important to let your patients know that. As far as pH testing, obviously pH impedance testing is, is considered the gold standard study for evaluating someone for pathologic reflux. It allows you to get a quantitative reflux um, um, data and also can, allows you to correlate symptoms with acid reflux events. Now this can be done uh, via wireless testing or catheter-based. I think for wireless testing, there are some uh, advantages. Uh, obviously the patient doesn't, it's more comfortable for the patient. They don't have anything sticking out of their nose, so it, the patients are more accepting of that. Um, it does have some downsides though. It doesn't allow you to really differentiate between acid and non-acid events. It doesn't allow you to have any evidence about what's going on in the proximal esophagus. Um, and uh, it can cause pain. Sometimes patients will get esophageal spasm or sort of uh, visceral hypersensitivity that requires the, the um, capsule to be removed early. So, uh, you know, there, there are definitely pros, but there are also some downsides to the wireless testing. I think for uh, catheter pH and penis testing, I think that the main advantage is that it really allows you to have information on proximal events. It also allows you to differentiate between acid and non-acid reflux events. Um, it's our, my personal preference to um, offer patients uh, catheter-based testing in our practice. I would say patients don't love it. They don't like having the, the catheter stick out of their nose, although I will say thank you, COVID, because now that patients are wearing uh, masks, <laughs> I've definitely had patients um, more accepting about wearing the, the catheter since it's not so visible. But the catheter, too, can coil uh, in, the, in the esophagus or malposition, and so, uh, again, if a patient has a terrible gag reflux, or some anatomic abnormality that doesn't allow the catheter to be placed, um, that's also something to consider. The good thing about uh, catheter-based testing is it doesn't require a repeat endoscopy. So again, that's something to think about if you're gonna do wireless testing that the patient would need to get another endoscopy uh, if, they haven't, if they've already had one beforehand.
So moving on to radiographic studies, I would say CT scans are not used that often for typical patients with reflux, although for our patients with parasoptal hernias, oftentimes they'll present to the emergency room with chest pain or epigastric pain, and they might show up in your office already with a CT scan. So I think that's the main reason that we might see a CT scan in those patients. If I do think that a patient has a large type 4 parasoptal hernia that might be suggested on another study, I will sometimes order a CT scan just to get an idea of what other organs are in the chest just to prepare for, you know, what, uh, for operative planning purposes, but not, not a routine study that we use um, for straightforward GERD patients. Of course, we have the classic, you know, air fluid level behind the, the heart that sometimes um, patients might get in the, the, the um, uh, emergency room and then some uh, uh, upper GI studies. I would say, again, in our practice, we are moving to um, um, cineesophagrams. Let's see, I hope this is going to play. Let's see, how do I go back? Can, I, can you play the. No? Oh. No, that's not it, but. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's fine. It's okay. Um, anyway, this, this was a cineosophagram that's distorted for some reason. But anyway, we, we'll use the cineosophagram that allows us to sort of screen for patients with esophageal dysmotility. So if you have a patient who's got a completely normal um, uh, motility noted on the esophagram, probably that's not somebody that I would order a esophageal manometry on unless for some reason they've got, you know, tremendous dysphagia symptoms or something else to suggest that they, that they might need to do that. Now, again, that, that doesn't necessarily need to be how you do it in your practice. That's just sort of what we do at, in, in Madison. Although for patients that do have uh, abnormal uh, motility noted on their esophagram or, again, patients with um, some sort of underlying uh, medical comorbidity that would suggest that they might have esophageal dysmotility, uh, those are the patients that we definitely would get high-resolution manometry on. And this is just a, uh, a, an example of a normal swallow on someone. Um, so you can see the, um, let's see. I'm having technological difficulties, but you can see the, the upper esophageal um, relaxation. The, you can see that the swallow has propagated nicely downstream, the EG junction relaxing. Then you can see the, 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 the transition point between the chest and the thorax where the diaphragm is. So this is an example of someone with a, a normal esophageal manometry. Um, and you can Oh my gosh, I don't know what happened to my slides, but <laughs> you can see that in uh, this patient, the first slide was someone with uh, panesophageal pressurization for someone with uh, type 2 achalasia. So the second slide is someone who's got a peristaltic break there. And then the third slide, it, that, I don't know what happened to my slides here, but the third slide did show the, that there was a, um, that what you could see on a manometry was someone with a um, hiatal hernia. Uh, the new, a new diagnostic study that's now being used by some uh, groups is uh, the endoflip. So endoflip is a func functional luminal imaging uh, probe. It's, uh, it's uh, used, it provides 3D imaging of the esophageal lumen using um, impedance planimetry, and it gives information on the uh, changes in pressure, diameter, uh, and um, distensibility of the esophagus. It also gives real-time information of um, GE junction distensibility sensibility, can provide information about the stiffness of the esophagus and also some dynamics of EG junction um, opening. So it can, it's, it's really being used much more frequently now. I would say some groups are actually advocating for the use of um, uh, uh, endoflip to replace uh, manometry. Um, some people use it intraoperatively to guide um, uh, whether or not their wrap is too tight or too loose. It can be used intraoperatively also uh, to guide in um, adequacy of myotomy for patients with achalasia. So there's lots of, lots of really cool uses for endoflip, and I know some of the people on the, on the panel here are using it quite often now. It'll be interesting to see what they think after, uh, during the session. Again, just some examples of, of what the, um, um, what the end of flip could look like. So the A over here is someone with a normal esophageal manometry on the top, and then you can see the corresponding um, uh, flip imaging. Uh, same thing for B, C, and D. So B is someone who's got type 1 achalasia with no contractility, and then you can see at the bottom that their distensibility is, is less than 2, and their G junction is not relaxing. Same thing with C, and then D is someone who's got sort of really repetitive contractions, and you can see 
see retrograde um, imaging on the end of flip below. So again, not, it's a nice, just some examples of what you, uh, how the end of flip can be used and how it compares with manometry. Uh, this is a, a way that you can use endoflip to sort of help you guide patients who you're not exactly sure what's going on. So in the first example here, you can see someone who's got obvious EG junction obstruction with an IRP of 27. You can see their barium swallow, the dilated esophagus, bird's beak, you know, consistent with achalasia, and then the endoflip, you know, correlates with that. It's got a uh, desensibility index of uh, 0.6, so that all correlates. B, you can see someone who's got sort of an equivocal finding on their manometry, but but then you can see that on their end of flip, it, it does correlate to someone with EG junction um, outflow obstruction, again, DI of 0.26, and then you correlate it with the barium swallow, you can see they've got obviously a lot of tertiary contractions and spasms. And then type C is an example of where it can really use to help you. So you have someone who's got kind of equivocal looking uh, manometry, uh, but then their um, end of flip is actually normal, and then you look at their barium swallow, and that's actually pretty normal too. So that's a nice way where you can sort of use it if you don't have correlation between your barium swallow and your manometry. Um, so those are just sort of the studies that we frequently use. I didn't go over gastric emptying studies, although I will use those for patients who've got, um, particularly patients who have diabetes or patients who have a tremendous amount of nausea and vomiting as their primary symptom to roll out gas, you know, gastroparesis uh, preoperatively. Uh, then the question is, what, what is the most appropriate procedure? So for those of you who attended the GERD consensus this morning, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not you should do a partial or a full fundoplication. It was a pretty, uh, interesting conversation, I would say. I would say right now in the United States, the uh, Nissen fundoplication is the most commonly performed operation. It's got lots of data that show long-term uh, success. Uh, although the, all of the randomized studies that have compared uh, Nissen's with partial fundoplications uh, do show relatively equivocal outcomes between the two operations as far as um, acid resolution, although the partial fundoplication um, does seem to reduce post-operative dysphagia uh, and gas bloat. So again, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the different wraps. I would say door fundoplication we're not really using as a primary anti-reflux operation at this point. Um, and then just to go over just some of the um, results from um, the meta-analysis that reviewed uh, outcomes between partial and full fund applications. You can see that for recurrent acid exposure, really pretty equivalent, uh, but then you can see for dysphagia, um, it favors uh, to pay, um, and ultimately, when you look at uh, patient satisfaction, again, pretty equivocal. So I would say which operation you use is probably um, surgeon's choice, although again, based on the consensus this morning, you know, that may not be um, what the, the consensus is gonna recommend, we'll see. Just a special last minute, few minutes, just to go over some special considerations on what you should do for patients who have reflux um, who are morbidly obese. So obviously lots of patients who are obese have reflux, and most, most of the time we'll try weight loss and anti-secretory medication, but if you do have a patient that comes to see you for, for really bad reflux and they're obese, I would say that in general, um, at least in my practice, I do tend to offer them a, a RUMI gastro bypass as their first operation, just because uh, we know that um, anti-reflux surgery in obese patients um, may have a higher uh, fail rate, and obviously they have all the advantages to the patient of their reduced comorbidities, weight loss, et cetera, that you get from the, from the bariatric surgery. So um, there's been a tremendous amount of studies uh, looking at this. This is the sleep pass study. They, this is the uh, Finnish, a Finnish study that published their five and then their uh, seven-year uh, data uh, looking at 240 patients uh, with seven-year follow-up looking at um, all the usual um, endpoints. But you can see, though, when they looked specifically comparing the sleep gastrectomy and the gastric bypass patients, you can see that none of the gastric bypass patients, either late um, or early, um, had any complications related to reflux. And then this was uh, another study that came out almost right at the same time. This is the SM Boss study. This is a Swiss study, again, randomized study, followed patients uh, for five years, looking at, again, most of the same um, out outcomes. And again, you can see that if you look at their baseline characteristics between the sleeve and the gastro bypass patients, pretty equivalent. But then when you look at their changes in comorbidities at five years, you can see that about 25% of the patients had remission uh, in, in the sleeve. Uh, gastrectomy group, but then about 
32% uh, of patients had uh, worsened and about 30% also had de novo development of reflux. So I would say those two studies as well as other studies that have been published since then really, um, really would suggest that if you have a patient who, who's obese, who has reflux, um, you should probably offer them a bypass and not a sleep gastrectomy. Again, this is just from the, the rest of the studies, and you can see that a lot of those patients that did de uh, develop worse reflux, they ended up having getting converted over to a gastro bypass. So, not not unex not unexpected. So in conclusion, there's lots of tools in our armamentarium that we can use to help diagnose and guide management for GERD. I would say there's not any specific algorithm that definitely should be followed, but I would say pick one that works for your group and one that can be uh, easily um, you know, followed by everyone in the group. Um, I would say as far as choice of operation, you know, partial versus uh, full, probably equivalent, um, just you know, maybe based on what you feel more comfortable with. And again, all the special considerations uh, regarding patients who are obese and have reflux. So thanks very much.